So in this next video, we're going to continue our look on the land adaptations of seed plants and conclude on, on a couple more different things that seed plants did in order to adapt to land uh, a little bit better than their uh, seedless counterparts, as we'll see. Land adaptations of seed plants, and this will be the part two to this. Okay, so here we're going to now also be looking at another big part, another big part to this adaptation, which was the idea of pollen and sperm production. So in the previous video, we established the idea that we have this ovule and egg production within the seed plants. And we know that it's a very complicated and sort of uh, wrapped up process that involves the megasporangium, megaspore, and integuments. The pollen and sperm production of the le these land and seed plants is also similar to that sort of overlapping and wrapped up process in the sense that we have a, a, an almost a, a, analogous location to this process. And that location is going to be instead of the megasporangium at the microsporangium. And from there, whenever you see sporangium or micro or mega, whatever it may be, this is going to immediately give you the development of a microspore within this region. And then from the microspore, you actually are going to get something known as pollen grains. So the pollen grain is our ultimate sort of developmental uh, end result of this structure that's seen here. And this pollen grain is going to be essentially the male gametophyte of seed plants. Male gameto for gametophyte. And the male gameto is going to be also protected. It's not just going to be open. It's actually going to be enclosed. And that's going to be an enclosure within a pollen wall. Now, why are we enclosing this? Why are we protecting it? Well, that's because we are on land. So land has a little bit more harsh environmental conditions than the water, and thus we have to enclose it with something known as a pollen wall. Now, more specifically, the pollen grain, this is an important, important part of the overall structure of seed plants and their life cycle altogether, especially on the male side. The fact of the matter is the pollen grain is actually two cells in one structure. So it's a two for one structure in which you're going to have a tube cell, which is one of the cells within the pollen grain. Remember, pollen grain, two cells. You cannot forget that. And then the other cell is known as a generative cell. Generative cell. The tube cell is going to be the one that produces something known as the pollen tube, which we'll get to when we talk about the life cycle a little bit later. So this produces the pollen tube. That's going to be critically important later on. And then the generative cell, this is the one that's going to be producing and does produce the sperm. So now previously we talked about how we have the eventual production of the egg on the female part of the seed plant. Now we're looking at the male parts of the seed plant. Now we have the production of sperm, but with the production of sperm, this is useless unless you also have this pollen tube. And this works well because the male gametophyte, which is essentially two cells, the tube cell and the generative cell, both together within this pollen grain structure. That's what we absolutely need. Now, a little bit more on this pollen wall. This pollen wall is going to be very protective, and you're going to, it's, going to, it's going to be useful, and it's going to make sense to use something that's of protective uh, capabilities, and that is something like sporopollenin. Sporopollenin is something we've talked about before. This is going to be a structure that's within the pollen grain, and specifically, this is going to be within the pollen grain wall that we just elaborated on right here. So this is sort of an extension to this. This sporopollenin is going to be important to remember. The reason why is because you have a male reproductive structure, a male gametophyte, just like you protected the female gametophyte with that very important integument structure. Here we have an analogous thing, the sporopollenin, which is also there because it protects the male gametophyte. So protecting these gametophytes is a big commonality amongst these seed plants. It's very important to protect them because they are going to be what allows for another generation to evolve or another generation to be born, let's say, or to, to actually surface in terms of a fertilization event, as we'll see. Okay, moving forward, we talked about pollen and sperm production. Now we also are going to talk about the fact that there's going to be a distinct event known as pollination that occurs. 
And pollination is something people have heard of but don't really understand the premise behind what it really means. Pollination is simply going to be the transfer of pollen. That's the entire process, but it's specific to something. The transfer of pollen is going to specifically happen to a, any part of a plant. So to part of plant. And so we have male pollen being formed. That's going to go to the female part of the plant. So that's going to be part of the plant with those ovules. And remember, the ovules contain the megasporangium, then the megaspore, and then the integument. So this is an important structure that we have to eventually get to in order to complete pollination. Now, one thing I want you to understand is that pollination is not, this is a big thing, it is not the same thing as fertilization. Fertilization is its own event altogether. Pollination is just the transfer of pollen, getting to the ovules, but actually fertilizing the egg that's within the ovules, that's fertilization, not pollination. Pollination is just this transfer, getting to the area, but actually doing the fertilization, of course, that's not pollination. So keep that in mind. In addition, one more thing about pollen and sperm production that's important when we think of land adaptations is the fact that on land, the sperm cell is not dependent sperm is not it is no longer dep for dependent on water for dispersal so the pollen essentially of these plants does not need water to be dispersed this is going to be an important structural sort of consequence because now what we notice is that these sperm no longer possess any flagella why don't they possess flagella? Well, that's because they have begun to colonize. The plants have begun to colonize dry habitats. And within these dry habitats, flagella becomes useless. This is no longer necessary because you can't move around in water. You're in a dry habitat. We're going to see different ways that this dispersal can continue and does continue and successfully goes on. But that's going to be a bit later on. One thing that's common about this sperm not having flagella and not being dependent on water anymore is the fact that both gymnosperms and also angiosperms have sperm that are non-flagellated that colonize dry habitats. So that's a commonality between both of those. A lot of this lecture is going to be differentiating gymno and angio. Commonality between them is the fact that their sperm structure is about the same. Finally, last thing about the land adaptations of seed plants is a general comparison. And this general comparison will be between two very important categories of plants. And that will be the seedless plants, much of which we covered in the previous lecture, and also that of which this looking at the seeded plants. So I'll just call them the seed plants. So first and foremost, in the seedless plants, what I want you to understand is that the spore structure, which we've covered in our previous lecture, the spore is the only protectant stage, okay? It's the only protectant stage. Now, that's the key word here, protectant stage. This is going to be because the spore at this stage is the only time in which the seedless plant suffers some invulnerability, I'll say. Specifically, the spore will be vulnerable to environmental stress, and so at that point is when we have a protectant stage. This protectant sta stage is going to be an important point of comparison when I talk about the seed plants in just a second because we'll see just how different the story is when we get to the seed plant. So the spore is definitely protected because the environment has difficult conditions. And sort of the end-all be-all that you want to take away from the seedless plants is the following. They're going to give off what is known as a single-celled spore, as we saw in our previous lecture. That single-celled spore is essentially, I like to call it, uh, fending for itself. It's on its own. It doesn't really have much sort of support or protection or dependency on really anyone. It's just doing its own thing once it's released into the environment. And for that direct reason, it has a notoriously shorter lifespan. And that shorter lifespan will be, of course, in comparison to the seed plants in just a second. That shorter lifespan is going to be also indirectly because of the fact that there's no store food for this pollen, to, for this spore, excuse me, to possibly grow with, to develop with. We're going to see a big difference right now when we talk about the seed plants. The seed plants, on the other hand, are not single-celled. They actually are multicellular in terms of their seed. 
So the structure that's going to eventually develop into the fully grown plant is a multicellular seed, whereas in the seedless plants, the structure of development of germination is a single-celled spore. So you already see a big difference between these two. This multicellular seed is great if you're living on the land because this multicellular seed is going to be essentially a developing embryo that's highly and well protected, as we saw in the previous two flowcharts, including this one, protected by the seed coat. That's the purpose. You are on land, you have a difficult environment, no longer are you fending for yourself, but instead you are protected by this or surrounding embryonic structure and uh, seed structure that allows you to be successful as a land plant, as we'll see even more so when we talk about the life cycles. I keep on saying that because it's important when we actually see those life cycles, all of this stuff actually surface. Finally, last thing about the seed plants, of course, multicellular seed provides protection for this growing and possibly germinating plant, but also, I said right here, the shorter lifespan is actually different in the seed plants because here we actually have stored nutrients within the seed. This is why seeds are so successful, they're plants at least, because of the fact that the nutrients are stored. So basically what can happen is these plants that give off seeds, the seeds themselves can be dormant. They may not necessarily need to germinate and grow fully for a long time. They can just sort of lay low until environmental conditions are perfect enough for them to truly germinate and truly grow because they have these stored nutrients. Stored nutrients means you can stay dormant for longer times, thus having a longer lifespan as a sort of developing plant. So that's our basic comparison. That completes our land adaptations. And now we'll get into the nitty gritty details of gymnosperms and angiosperms and their life cycles um, as we look at these seed plants.